Good evening, everyone. I know we still have a few people who are still getting food, but we're going to go ahead and kick off. I'm Gretchen Crosby-Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. We are so pleased this evening to host this friendly debate on the proper role and size of government. We are incredibly grateful to both Governor Markell and Governor Sanford for serving as resident Pritzker Fellows at the IOP this quarter. We and our students have had a wonderful time getting to know them, downloading their insights on the issues of the day, their wisdom accumulated over several decades in politics, and their advice for students who want to make their own contributions to our democracy in the future. Thank you both. I do want to mention a, a couple of upcoming events. Um, next Wednesday, Marty Barron of the Washington Post will be in conversation uh, with law school legend Jeff Stone at the Logan Center. May 28th, David Axelrod will be recording a live Axe Files episode with a uh, even more legendary Bob Woodward. May 30th, we will welcome Patrick Gaspard, former US ambassador to South Africa and current president of the Open Societies Foundation for a conversation on global trends toward nationalism and isolationism. You can find out more about all upcoming IOP events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. We will open up the floor to take questions from the audience. Please line up behind the microphone that's going to be over in this aisle. As usual, we give priority for the first three questions to be asked by our students, and we'd love to see a nice mix of women and men asking questions. We remind you that a question ends in a question mark. Uh, we'd like to ask you to please make sure your phones are on silent right now. Restrooms are downstairs if you need them. And here to formally introduce our speaker is Annalise Wagner. Annalise is a master's student from Gainesville, Florida, now at the Harris School of Public Policy. She is highly engaged at the IOP, attending many events and seminars, and this quarter she is serving as an events ambassador. Please join me in welcoming Annalise to the podium. This evening, we are joined by Governors Jack Markell and Mark Sanford to discuss the topic, government, do we need more or less? This question forms the foundations for how competing ideologies in the United States think about solving the same problems. One viewpoint trusts the free market to create the best outcomes, while the other advocates for government intervention to fix market failures and smooth inequities. The end goals are often the same, but the means diverge based on these worldviews. Governor Jack Markell served as the governor of Delaware from 2009 to 2017. His initiatives in office can be characterized by a belief that government should be involved in developing programs and interventions for its constituents. A standout example of this is in the field of education. Governor Markell created innovative programs, such as the statewide language immersion program to prepare students to engage in a global economy, and a Pathways to Prosperity program to give high school students the ability to earn industry-recognized credentials in various fields. Governor Mark Sanford served as governor of South Carolina from 2003 to 2011, and as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1995 to 2001, and from 2013 to 2019. During his terms in both offices, Governor Sanford was known for his staunch commitment to fiscal responsibility. As governor, he oversaw the first cut to the marginal income tax rate in South Carolina history and the largest recurring tax cut in state history. He once expressed his fierce opposition to any pork project, projects by bringing live pigs into the South Carolina State House. By the end of his time in governor, the Cato Institute recognized him as the most fiscally conservative governor in the country. We are very fortunate to have both governors as resident Pritzker Fellows at the IOP this quarter. Today's discussion will be moderated by David Axelrod. Mr. Mr. Axelrod is the director of the Institute of Politics and previously served as a chief strategist and senior advisor to President Barack Obama. He is the host of the top-rated podcast, The Axe Files. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you had live pigs in there, huh? Because somebody caught them and cooked them. And, yeah, they're gone now. Yeah, and the, <laughs> the smell is killing me yeah. here. I can tell, uh, I can separate it's not, not just the color of hair, but I can separate the students from the non-students uh, because the students are online out there getting food and all you guys were in your seats. I am so pleased to be with both you guys and I have to tell you what an incredible um, treat it's been to have you at the Institute of Politics and to have you together. 
because one of the things that I believe firmly, and I think that we have to find a way back to, is that you can have deep disagreements uh, and still uh, see beyond those and, and find the humanity in each other and have a respectful discourse. So don't let me down. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I just want to start, I, I have two quotes, um, one, both from Republicans, Governor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm doing this for you and also I'm, I'm dressed like you for yeah. 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 moral support, I need Exactly, <laughs> especially because Jack's got his briefing exactly team. Exactly right, yeah. Uh, you know, Lincoln said the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. Ronald Reagan famously said, in, uh, and he, this phrase never gets quoted exactly, but in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And I want to ask you both, just, I just want to frame the discussion with those quotes, but I want to ask you both to talk about a government that is, as an institution and what you think um, its essence is and what you think its limits should be. And uh, Jack, you want to start? And sure. Well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having, having us. The experience at the Institute of Poli Politics has been fantastic, uh, including uh, serving with, uh, with Governor Sanford and the other fellows, and the students are just tremendous. Uh, I do want to say that my, my wife, Carla, has come because when she heard that I was having this experience with Mark Sanford, everybody knows that Mark Sanford is the single best debater that oh. has ever served <laughs> in a state house uh, anywhere. I think you just certified yourself as a skillful debater. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think the, the whole notion of is government too big, is government too small, I mean, it's almost become a caricature of itself. And I think we have lost, um, I think the world has sort of turned upside down. You know, people were really surprised uh, recently when Elizabeth Warren got, you know, a lot of positive publicity for her appearance in West Virginia in front of a lot of Republicans. Bernie Sanders got a very favorable response uh, on a Fox, Fox town hall. And people would have thought, you know, they're both for bigger government, their audience was smaller governments, and none of this could make any sense. And I just don't think it's the way that people think about it anymore. I think for the most part, people realize that there is a role uh, for government to play. Uh, some of that role is to protect people. I mean, I think the single most important uh, role that government can play is to keep us safe. I mean, that's really what uh, it's all about. And we think about that generally in, in, in terms of public safety. But there are other ways. I mean, I think about, um, for example, the financial crisis. I think government should have done a whole lot more to have protected us from that. Uh, there are, you know, when I, when I read this week that um, President Trump is talking about scaling back the protections for the offshore oil rigs. We need more government in that case rather than less government. And so I think, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, neither of us is here to talk, about, you know, to promote a bloated bureaucracy. Uh, we want government to be smarter, whether it is small or whether it's big. And I think we need to think about what is it that government to, and I, I know the reason I got into politics in the first place, and I think it's probably true of most of us, is because we want to make sure we do everything we can so that more people can achieve their potential. It's really about the word of, it's about the word of opportunity. There may be different ways of getting there. I do believe that there are things that government can do, whether it's the world language immersion program or so many other th things that we can do. We want to make sure that we're doing it effectively and efficiently. We want to make sure that we're doing what we can so that taxpayers get the best return on their investment. Um, so I think there's an important role for government to play, but we also recognize that uh, you know individuals, um, we, we do have we have a, a a system of economy here that has worked. It's not working very well right now for everybody, but over a long period of time, it's worked pretty darn well. And one of the reasons it's worked really well is because it gives people the incentive uh, to create, to produce, and to create a better life uh, for themselves. And we want a government that can make sure that that can happen, but that people don't get hurt in the process. You have probably used the word limited government uh, more times than anyone can count over the course of your political career, but what, what is it that you think government should do? Um, let me begin with uh, ditto to everything that Jack said, but both with regard to the attributes of the Institute, 
uh, your leadership, Gretchen's, uh, Alicia, go down the list, been incredibly impressed with the team and thankful that for the time here. Um, your answer is going very well, by the way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were dittoing everything else. Exactly right. Yeah. And I ditto what he said. What I think is interesting about governorships is that fundamentally they're pragmatic roles. And I think that whether you look at a Republican or Democratic governor, in, in a surprising bandwidth, there is unity with regard to the way that governors approach problems. The problem, in, in philosophic terms, has been more at the national level, where in their immense debates, Frankly, on relatively small things, though. I mean, if you look in the aggregate over the next 10 years, you know, roughly, uh, we're going to spend around $60 trillion, right, going forward over the next 10 years as a federal government. If you look at the Democratic uh, budget versus the Republican budget, mathematically, there's not that much difference. Uh, but you would think it's, it's seismic, given the way that the debate goes. So I think that there's a real difference, even at the federal level, between the debates that take place which are at times piercing and rough, and what people are actually talking about in terms of Delta on spending. Although part of the reason that those budgets look a lot alike is a lot of that spending is mandated. So the discretionary piece of it, and particularly the domestic discretionary pieces, is, 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 is a rather small Yeah, now part. you bring up a very legitimate point, which is the Trump budget, for instance, guts domestic discretionary over the next 10 years. It's completely dead on arrival. It's completely make-believe. Uh, he said, we're not going to touch entitlements. Here's the interesting thing, if you look at the budget over the next 10 years. Uh, more than half of your federal budget will go to payments to people above the age of 65. Many folks need it. But frankly, many folks don't. If look, you look, look at the wealthiest, look, look, look around the room. Yeah, yeah, here for careful a about you my audience wanna... here. Yeah. <laughs> Wise up. <laughs> but, but if you think about uh, as an investment, going back to the things that Jack talked about, in many cases, we're misplacing that investment. Some of the wealthiest people in the country are getting those benefits, though they do not need them. And so I think what we would probably agree on, whether you're Republican or Democrat, and certainly from this very conservative Republican's perspective, is the money ought to go to people who need it, as opposed to so many other things that we see in government, and that's my beef with government. You. Uh, he's, he's, he's obviously making a case for means testing of, uh, of Social Security, of Medicare, and these programs. Do you, are you open to that? Well, of course, I mean, Medicaid is pretty much a means tested right. uh, program. I mean, I do, I do think we need to, be, we can't be all things to all people, which is sort of what we've become. And I think people on both sides of the aisle uh, are, are responsible for that. I mean, I think if you look at Social Security specifically, uh, you, could all, you could make a, a, a reasonable argument. I mean, if you think about why the math is so bad, when, when Social Security was first developed, there were tens and tens and tens and tens of workers for every retired person. But with people living longer and retiring earlier, the numbers have absolutely flipped. It's clearly not sustainable. Now, the question is, what do you do about that? Do you reduce benefits to people who perhaps don't need it? Or do you say we're going to raise the, the cap uh, on income that is you know, taxed for Social Security and maybe add another year of eligibility on? I mean, I, I don't know what the right answer is. I think it's a conversation that's worth having. And I, th I, I do think it was disappointing when uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission you know, really sort of didn't go anywhere. I mean, it was, I think it was, a, it was an effort put forward in, in, in uh, good faith uh, by both sides. But it just, you know, I think for political reasons, was not going to, to go anywhere. But I, look, we do have to, be, we have to be very thoughtful about where the money's going. And from a state level, you know, states essentially do three things. We educate, we medicate, and we incarcerate. That is where the money's going. And, and you and, alliterate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, but what's, what's happened is because of, uh, you know, the huge increase in healthcare costs, and frankly, because of mass incarceration, there's less money to put to the things that we would like to put it to, education, quality of life, and the like. And so I think we do have to have uh, some pretty you know, hard conversations about where this, how we're going to get out of this unsustainable rut we're in. So, but, but, but can, can I interject? In other words, you, you were sort of nudging me on the, the bigger philosophic point. And, and let me say, here's why I believe that we ought to look at limiting government wherever we can. 
If you read Paul Kinney's book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, what he talks about in that book is that historically the biggest thing that government could get overstretched on was a standing army. But that's no longer the case. Nowadays, with entitlement spending, which is, again, about two-thirds of, of our federal budget, it's really on the entitlement side. But, but the point of his book, and it was, it's been reiterated with book, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff, with, this time it's different, and I get it, there, there were questions with regard to some of their methodology, but it's a legitimate point, which is governments tend to get ahead of their skis for a couple of different reasons. One is just human nature. So, for instance, in South Carolina, one of the things that we fought hardest against when I was governor, you had a senior senator by the name of Glenn McConnell, actually head of the South Carolina Senate, who happened to dress up on weekends as a Confederate War reenactor, and that was his thing. He also happened to have a store where they sold Confederate memorabilia, and that was his thing. Long story short, because it's his thing, next thing you know, it becomes a state project to go out and spend more than $60 million uh, extracting the Hunley, which was the first submarine, which was actually used in the Civil War, sank off the coast of South Carolina, but to go out, re extract it, bring it back, build an institute, long story short, pawn it off on the uh, Clemson University as a, quote, restorative institute. And as we fought this thing, I remember having a conversation with one of the folks saying, well, let me get this right. There's not really a big market for Confederate War research submarine material. How does this work exactly? But because that was his thing, that's what we spent $60 million on as a state. And you can go, I mean, I think it's interesting to look at today's paper, the fact that the FAA, which was charged with watching out on the, you know, the, 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 the 787, well, they said, well, Boeing, you'll take care of it. Either it's, it's mistakes in human terms, it's biases in human terms, or it's the bias that's built into the government, which is for every program out there, there's diffused cost and there's concentrated benefit. So I remember back when I was like a sophomore or freshman in Congress, the, the sugar subsidy program at that time cost about, about, about a billion dollars a year in the form of higher sugar price. At that time, there was about 250 million of us in America, which is to say it cost each of us about $4 in the price of sugar. Who's gonna take a trip to Washington to save $4? Nobody, but that benefit, that billion dollars went down to about 60 domestic sugar producers, the largest of whom was the Fan Hool family, who at that time was on the Forbes 400 list. They had yachts and helicopters and owned Casa de Campo in the Dominican Republic. Believe me, they were there. And they pulled every lever possible, even though only about three districts in the country were directly impacted by sugar subsidies. They teamed up with beet producers and others. Next thing you know, a, 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 an item that you could not sell in 90% of the congressional districts across this country passed, and we lost by three votes. And when the gavel went down, I remember looking back at the back section of the gallery, and there were a bunch of folks in gray suits giving each other high fives because they'd won for the day. There are a lot of built-in inefficiencies in government, and the reason I think it needs to be smaller is because I think Milton Friedman was right. His, his point was the ultimate measure of government is what it spends. At times, you have to limit it that way. But there are needs out Certainly. there that uh, are, are going unmet. The, the civil engineers say we've got $4.5 trillion in unmet uh, infrastructure needs, just keeping up our physical plant of the country to move goods and services. It's something that every economy needs. In fact, Lincoln, during the Civil War, uh, uh, signed off on bonds for the Transcontinental Railroad because he understood that once the war was over, that if the economy was going to thrive, there needed to be this railroad. So uh, isn't, isn't... Well, but even so, we have an inefficient delivery system. Think about the funding formula. This won't go over well in Illinois, I get it. But it favors Rust Belt or Northeast states because that's historically where the population has been, and it disfavors where the growth is taking place and where there's profound infrastructure need in terms of new people coming into those communities, whether that's in Florida or Texas or Southern California or Arizona, based on the funding formula itself. He who holds the goal wants to hang on to the goal, which at times makes for real inefficiency in the system. Taking, uh, uh, taking under advisement what uh what Governor Sanford said about um, how the money is distributed. 
we still have this $4.5 trillion gap. What should government the, be doing about it? I mean, frankly, the, the inability to do an infrastructure deal is shocking because all, the federal government is like the only place I know that is mixing up infrastructure money with operating money. I mean, every other, I mean, states, I mean, I, you know, in our state, we had an operating budget, we had a capital budget. And the, it's perfectly fine to borrow money. You know, if you want to do it with the gas tax, do it with the gas tax. I don't really care what the mechanism is. But when you're building things that are, that are going to last 40, 60, 80 years, there's going to be an economic return to it. And so it's worth making that investment and it's worth borrowing against it. The problem is when you are, in, you know, when you're borrowing, you know, it's the, the states, 49 of the 50 states are required to have a balanced budget. I think Vermont's the one that is not. And so we can't. We don't borrow money to fund operating expenses. We have to, you know, if we have to raise taxes, if we have to cut spending, if we have to do the, the two together. But that has nothing to do with infrastructure. And we, we figure out a way to make those local infrastructure uh, investments. So I think it's unbelievable that we've not been able to, to do that. I, I do want to make one other structural point on something that Mark mentioned earlier. And you mentioned as well, which has to do with sort of the two-generation piece. There was, there was a great, really important book, I think, written about 15 or 20 years ago called The, uh, the Coming Generational Storm or Intergenerational Storm, which was about the coming conflict between younger people and older people. The older people were going to want to make sure they protect and perhaps enhance Social Security, Medicare, and the like. And that was going to uh, divert resources that the younger people were going to want on, you know, things that Mattered, mattered to them. What well, hasn't really happened that way, and it hasn't happened that way because everybody's agreed, you know, to just print money. The Republicans are, you know, part of the, you know, the, the hypocrisy, and I can't really put Mark in this category because he really, he was one of the few, but the hypocrisy on the Republican side of people who cared so much about the, the deficits when President Trump, when President Obama was president, and who now have totally caved and who, to, who have totally rolled over, and it's like deficits don't matter. And at some point, the, the, somebody's going to have to pay the piper. Because what's you know, it, it would have been one thing if we'd had this conflict and we would have had to figure out we're going to cut spending here in order to make investments there has not happened because everybody's gotten everything that they've wanted, more or less. And at some point, that, at some point the economy is going to pay the price for that. So if you're, um, if you're railing about irresponsible fiscal policies and you're railing about irresponsible fiscal, po fiscal policies, this isn't going to be much of a debate. <laughs> uh, um, but I want to ask you uh, about this uh, because um, these massive infrastructure needs um, if government doesn't, if government doesn't step in and do some of this, or a lot of it, is it going to get done, or are we just going to have uh, the, the the civil engineers give our country a D plus in uh, in terms of keeping our infrastructure up to date? Do we just live with that uh, as a matter of principle, or what, what exactly should we do about it, or do you think that the markets will take care of it? Uh. I have no problem with markets taking care of it. Um, I, I, think I don't that, either. I'm just asking I, if you think they I, I, will. Yeah, no, but, but, and, and so what I'd say is, uh, if you look at some of the new capacity that's coming online, it is in fact toll roads. And given the way that technology has changed with regard to tolling, it's becoming more and more of a viable option. And so you have a big fat outfit out of Australia and a big outfit out of Spain, a couple of others around the world, wherein they are going out, raising capital, and investing in projects uh, because there's a, a real rate of return. I think that that's important in terms of new capacity. I think politically it's impossible in terms of existing capacity. But even then, again, going back to the inefficiencies in the system, uh, I remember uh, looking at the data behind HOA lanes, uh, high occupancy uh, lanes. It really doesn't support a separate lane uh, versus some of the other. And so if you said, what if we price that? And, and the, for instance, there's a, I forgot the name of the toll road outside of San Diego, where they have variable pricing based on picking your peak. And so for the person who's retired or the student who says, you know, I can go kind of any time to go do my shopping, they can pick a time that's lower. And the person that has to go when they got to go, well, they're going to pay accordingly. I think we ought to look at more options on that front. But here's the bigger but point. You, you, Wait, here's the bigger point, though. 
Israel arguably has some of the tightest security in the world, and yet they have a privatized function with regard to many of their security functions at their airports. I remember having a conversation with Steve Large in, uh, post 9-11, and at that point, uh, the federal government federalized 45,000 workers. And I said, what's the, you know, you're a conservative, allegedly a conservative, what, what's the deal? He goes, look, it was just too big a wave right now, you couldn't resist the wave. And there are a lot of things that come like that where in, because of emotion or because of the moment that you're in politically, you just gotta go that direction, which is why, he, and I'm not begrudging him, I wasn't there. But what I would say is, why not look at more options where in the private sector, particularly given the way that technology has moved along, could take care of the function as opposed to having it be a government? It hasn't worked very well. I mean, just, in I mean, Israel? Really, no, I mean, I, in general, when, we, when the public sector trusts, they hand over responsibility to the private sector. I mean, private prisons have been a disaster. For-profit uh, K-12 has not worked very well. I, I don't think, you know, to your point about the infrastructure, I, didn't, I had not heard the 4.3 trillion figure about 10 years ago. I heard a figure about 2.3. This is when uh, Ed Rendell and Schwarzenegger and Bloomberg put together right. their, so in 10 years, it's, it's basically right. doubled. If the market was gonna take care of it, the market would have come close to taking care of it. The market's nowhere close to taking care of it. And, and so I think this is one of those cases and it should be doable. I mean, and you know, I, we'll see. I mean, I think uh, Pelosi and Schumer were supposed to visit with the president today. He had thrown out this $2 trillion uh, figure. It's something that everybody should be able to uh, get behind. But the question is, uh, you know, is the politics just so dysfunctional that they can't? But I, I don't think that the market is going to be able to do it on its own. And frankly, it really is, I, I had an experience. We, we did a lot around quality of life investments in Delaware because we really felt that uh, these days, you know, you want to attract the kinds of companies, you want to keep the kinds of companies that value talent. Most companies do and talented people want to work in places where they want to live. And so things like outdoor parks and trails and all that really matter. And I can't tell you how many uh, members of the uh, General Assembly I had, and they happen to have all been Republican, come say to me, government should not be investing in bike trails. We should let the private market do that. It would never happen. They've got no, they've got no reason to. Now, I mean, here in, here in Chicago, I think actually a private individual contributed to the recent separation of the uh, pedestrian lanes and, and yes, the cycling but that, lanes. Yes, that was the exception rather than that. Uh, absolutely, and so I think this is a place where the... Where the but, but can I interject, and, and with due respect to you as a Democrat, um, um, I, I, I'm just I a moderator. A moderate one, <laughs> and a good one. No, no, no. <laughs> but I didn't say I, moderate, I just said moderator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, what I would say is that oftentimes my Democratic friends love to pick a, a subject like transportation as a focal point because I think that whether we're right or left in our philosophy would agree that, you know, that's something that's real, it stays there, it doesn't disappear, uh, although there can be some fraud, waste, and abuse certainly in the process, but it's pennies on the dollar. And I keep going back to the number of students that I see across this room, and I think about what is the world that you're gonna grow up look, gonna look like in economic terms based on the pile of unsustainable promises that have been put out there by politicians. So Lawrence Kotlikoff at the University of Boston has done a thing uh, uh, called generational accounting. He says, what's the imputed lifetime tax for a child born into America today? And the number is a remarkable 82%. Now obviously we won't get there. Something will break between now and then. It, it, more often than not, if history is any guide, it'll be the financial markets bring us back to reality. But what that means is either wrenching inflation a break in the value of the dollar, but something that degrades the future standard of living of young people born in America today. And I think that that's the big picture that we gotta keep focused on, which is I wouldn't, I'd see the point with regard to transportation, but that's not where the big inefficiencies so, are. But let's talk about healthcare then. Yeah, sure. Because I mean, I, th I, I you know, agree with, the, with that analysis, but at the same time, I mean, when it came to the Affordable Care Act, and I'm sure, you know, when I was running for governor for the first time, 2008, you were, you had been gov you were already governor, you had yeah. been in Congress before then. Before the Affordable Care Act, by far, the single biggest issue people talked to me about on the campaign trail was health care and inability to get it. The Affordable Care Act came along, not perfect, but did an unbelievable job, particularly at expanding access. And so the Republicans spent a decade trying to kill it without having anything to 
recommend in its place. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I do think, I mean, I, I think it's not fair to say, you know, it's easy to pick on transportation, because I do think there are a bunch of other issues where, you know, there, is, there has been a real difference between the parties. And I think that one in particular, and even as recently as, you know, last year when, they, when, the, when the vote went down, as recently as a few months ago, when, or la last month, when, you know, Trump says he wants to, uh, he's going to court to try to kill the Affordable Care Act altogether. Yeah. And um, there, there are places, it would have been nice if the market had worked for all of those people. The market works really well for those of us who have an employer. But there are millions of people across the country for whom the market was not working at all when it came to accessing health care. You know, the Democrats lost overwhelmingly in the 2010 election, be frankly, because the, you know, the president had the, the courage to do, to do what he did. There was a political price to pay, but I think in the end it will definitely have been proven to be the right thing. But, but again, on that, I actually had the Republican counterpart to the Affordable Care Act, uh, a replacement bill. The problem, as I saw it, and I think as many people have seen it with regard to the Affordable Care Act, was there was a self-selection built into the process because, there were, in other words, if, every, if you could force everybody into the system, I'd completely agree with it. But that's not what happened. So there was a relatively nominal charge to say, if you don't go on, we're going to fine you. And so a lot of young and healthy folks said, I'm pretty healthy, I'll take the fine. And so it became self-selecting where and sicker and sicker or and older and older begin to go into the system such that from an actuarial standpoint it couldn't stand which then begin to drive numbers in the wrong direction. And, and so I absolutely agree with you with regard to intent. Um, but again, I think what we've got to look at, which is too often overlooked in the world of politics, is the math. Is it sustainable? But, but and my big push in terms of government overall is I completely agree with many of the things we would want in government, but the big question for the next generation, for my four sons, for your kids, is, is it sustainable? And by any accounting mechanism, you look at our numbers today, we're headed over a cliff. Our numbers are not sustainable at the federal level. So you would have supported, you think the Affordable Care Act's great flaw was that the, the penalty for, for not adhering to the mandate wasn't high enough? I mean, I will tell you that that was a big discussion, uh, and there were, and it was most, and, and most of the people, remedy, in, but yes, most of the people in your, there, a lot of people in the Republican Party, who were at least open to voting for it, never did, uh, said, and, and some Democrats, well, we'll do this, but we don't want this penalty to be that high. Sure. But let me ask you a different question, because your debt I know is is a cause. Can I, can yeah, I make one just, comment before yeah, you do that? Yeah. Still yeah. in health care. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, th I think that criticism is a fair one, but the Republicans made it so much worse in the following way. So one of the things, and I don't want to get in the weeds, but I think it's important for people to understand, one of the things that was built into the Affordable Care Act, because there was this uncertainty about how many people were going to sign up, how sick they would be, and so there was something called, the technical term was risk corridor, which basically said to the insurance companies, if the population of people who sign up are not very healthy and it's more expensive to care for them than we expect, then the insurance companies can be made whole because they were taking a big risk without knowing how expensive it was going to be. Marco Rubio led the charge, totally political, said it was a bailout of the insurance companies, refused to fund the risk corridors, and so what has happened between that and then between the Republicans refusing to uh, fund some of the outreach to make sure that more healthy people could sign up. What happened is, is they, they, they made it much more likely that the thing would uh, ex essentially fall under its own weight. And so I, I sure, you know, there are a lot of people who def definitely believe that it's not wor working as well as it should, but it, it, it better be fixed rather than I mean, do, 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 you, do you believe that government has an obligation to ensure that people can get health care, that they can have health coverage? You know, we're the only... We're the only uh, industrialized country that doesn't have some sort of national sure. health care program, and we pay far more for our health care, and, and the outcomes are, are, in many cases, not as good. Um, well, not in terms of sick care. If you look at our, our country in terms of sick care, we're the best in the world. 
So if you want to have a lung transplant or a heart transplant or whatever else, you're not going to Canada, you're not going to Britain, you come to the United States. And if you don't get preventive care, you may right. need it Bingo. a lot sooner. And where we're not is on the preventive care. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. I mean, I tortured my former wife and our kids. We did a bicycle across the state. We're trying to raise awareness on the importance of prevention and eating right and exercise, and it went pretty much nowhere. Uh, but but, but uh, uh, on, on the subject, on the sub subject of debt, um, you both have mentioned uh, debt. I, I have to ask you this question. Um, you voted for the tax cut in 2017 when you were in Congress, $1.5 trillion. Everybody said that will add to the, the, these deficits and ultimately to the debt. Uh, the argument and counter was this will spur such economic growth that it will, you know, it will ameliorate the losses of of revenue, that hasn't happened. And the debt, debt now we're now at 22 mm -hmm. billion, it's accelerated. Um, did you, were you wrong or did, when you made that calculation? You were a moderator. I know, um, but I, <laughs> <laughs> old, habits, <laughs> yeah, old yeah. habits die hard. The, the, uh, what I'd say is this, um, if you have insomnia tonight, I've got the cure. Because I actually, I used to write a Facebook post describing every vote that I took, all the major votes. And so I, I wrote a very long-winded five or six page uh, sort of write-up of that particular vote. And what I said were two things. Uh, one, if you look at, at, at revenue to the federal government, it has been remarkably consistent over the last 50 years at about 18% of GDP. I mean, high tax rate environment, low tax rate, you can only squeeze but so much blood from a turnip, and it's about 18%. And so I said, if, if this had taken us well off that mark, I would not have felt comfortable with it. I would have voted no. In fact, if you look at the 10-year numbers, we stay right there at about 18%. And that the profound problem, in my view, is still on the spending side. Because if you look at, again, the 10-year numbers, in one case, we'll spend $43 trillion over the next 10 years. In the other case, we're going to spend $41.5 trillion. It's a 3.5% difference. Is that 3.5% difference the, you know, worth the trade-off of seeing if we can become more competitive? I actually, it made actually national news when I said this is not a middle-class tax cut. Fundamentally, this is a corporate tax reduction and restructuring bill, and it's simply a bet that we might become more competitive. Now, whether or not we won that bet, still up, up to debate, but, but, but that, that's fundamentally what that bill was. And I think it was worth a try, because if you look at the number of corporations who were beginning to domicile elsewhere, we had a problem, a trend line. And that was originally a Democratic bill. It actually started by widening that on the West Coast years ago, saying we've got to do something about restructuring our corporate tax rate environment. I think there were very few economists who expected that that tax cut would have the intent, actually have the intended effect if you were going to cut, I mean, because there are so many, there were so many problems with that vote. One, it does increase the deficit, and the idea that it was going to generate sufficient growth to offset the cut, uh, and not. And I never increase. said that. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying you did. Yeah. And frankly, the reason this isn't much, is, is not as much fun is because you have been on the right side of many of these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like putting other people in your seat. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm looking yeah, at their yeah, face yeah. and not yours. So first of all, I mean, the, the, the whole idea that it was going to generate any kind of growth, yeah, maybe it had that sort of the sugar high, you know, for a short period of time. Sure. Some people, some employees got a $1,000 bonus that there are, you know, companies decided to do. Fine. But that's a really big problem because that's how it was, that's how it was sold, that it was going to grow the economy and be everybody's, to everybody's benefit, and it wasn't. That's number one. Number two, it sure would have been nice if the, the folks actually getting the benefit of that cut had been the people who really needed it. And they really weren't. They just weren't. And number three, I think part of this is totally political. So many of the Republicans for so long have basically said, whatever we do, we need to shrink government. I mean, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They complain that government doesn't work, they shrink it, and then it really doesn't work. No, I'm serious. I mean, and, and, that, and that is part of what I think drove this. So I think on, like, on three different levels, uh, that was a, a really a, a bad bill, a, a, ba a bad vote, and I think it's not helping the country. Um, let me ask about, you, you, you put this in, I think, properly so, in the context of the future that these young people uh, are going to lead. What are the, is, is reducing debt 
the, uh, the most important thing we have to do? And what about uh, other things, investments in healthcare, investments in, uh, in education, which seems uh, pretty crucial in, sure. the, in the 21st uh, century? Um, are there things that, um, that, that, that necessitate spending more? Or, or do you just feel that inefficiencies will make room for right. all of them? So, so can I get weirdly philosophic for a second? Um, it, depends, so, it depends how weird. OK. <laughs> no, not too weird, just a little bit weird. So there, there's a, a little known Scottish historian who lived in the 1800s, Sir Alex Francis <laughs> Taylor. Uh, who studies history for the whole of his life and the quote attributed to him at the end of life, and there's even some question of whether or not he really deserves this quote, but the quote attributed to him at Lysen was, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote for themselves largest from the public treasury with the result that a democracy always fails under loose fiscal policy and is generally followed by dictatorship. The average age of the world's great civilizations has been 200 years. These nations have progressed through this sequence, from bondage to spiritual faith, spiritual faith to great courage, great courage to liberty, liberty to abundance, abundance to selfishness, selfishness to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy to dependency, and from dependency, back again into bondage. And so what I would say... So good night, everybody. Yeah, good night. <laughs> <laughs> What I would say is that if you look at the timeline of civilizations, there are some scary things that have gone on over the years, and more often than not, the scene that Reinhardt and Rogart were getting at, which is countries spinning their way into oblivion, has held true. And so do I believe that we ought to put more into basic research? Yes. Do I think that we ought to do uh, better allocate money that's spent within education? Yes. But I, again, have seen firsthand, and I'm sure Jack has seen firsthand, and I know you've seen firsthand, the level of inefficiency that goes with our system because it's an amazingly human and responsive system, and it responds to those that are making noise, and oftentimes the people that aren't making noise are the people that have the most to lose or to gain the system. So I'll be slightly less philosophical, um, but this is why I do like sitting in on his classes. They're always really interesting. Um, you know, look, I think the, your question was, are there things more important than reducing the debt? Well, so my uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of predicting, in, sort of, in, in terms of addressing the major challenges that will confront this and future right. generations, yeah. Yeah. are there other things that should be priorities as well? Yes, I, and, and which is not to say that that's not a priority, but I, I'll say this. I mean, I think the, the strength of our democracy the strength of capitalism is incredibly dependent upon how much confidence people have in the underlying system, which means, is the economy working for them? And I think for way too many people, it's not. So we're not going to cut our way to prosperity. We're not going to tax our way to prosperity. The only way to get to prosperity is to grow, but, or and, and to make sure that the bounties of that growth are shared more broadly. I mean, this is the fundamental problem. And, that, and what is government's role in that? I think, it's, I think there's several. I think uh, one of the most important ones is to make sure that more people have the skills that they need to participate in that, in that economy. I, I, do, I don't think it's about uh, uh, you know, the guaranteed basic income, or I can't remember whether there are a couple different titles for that, because I think if we get away from recognizing the dignity of work and basically just saying we're going to fill people's pockets instead, it's really bad for the country, it's really bad for the culture. So I think um, part, part of it is, you know, it starts with education, it starts with skill development, it has to do with the appropriate amount of regulation, appropriate, but appropriate does include making sure we're enforcing the antitrust laws more effectively. It does mean that we're protecting people from uh, safety events. I mean, I do think this, this idea of what's, you know, the, the idea of pulling back uh, uh, regulation on the offshore drilling is just really in indicative. Um, I think, you know, there are probably some things around the margins that the Obama administration did about making sure more people were eligible for overtime and the like. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know all the details of that. So I, I think there's a lot, but I, you know, to me, 
The issue of the day is are people going to feel, are people going to have a reason to have confidence in our democracy? Are they going to have reason to have confidence in capitalism? And a lot of that means do people feel like they're actually invested? Is the American dream going to be real again? I mean, I think this is such a massive issue. And I never thought I'd be saying this. I mean, you know, when, when, when Mark and I were, are exactly the same age. And so when we were kids uh, growing up, it real, for the most part, it really didn't matter that much. If you, were, if you were poor and you worked hard and played by the rules, you could have an expectation that you could, like, go into the m middle class. And that and other countries at the time were so much more class oriented and they never had that kind of economic mobility. And that's changed. And so when, when we talk about the American dream not being real for people, unfortunately, economic mobility is not what it used to be. And the American dream is just not as real as it once was. And I think we have got to put everything behind us to make sure that we make that real again. If we do that, then I think these other issues will take care of itself. And if we don't, I hate to think, I hate to think what's going to happen to our democracy. Can I add this, though? Yeah. So I, again, agree with what Jack's getting at. But the reason that I think paying down and dealing with debt and the spending trajectory is paramount is think about this. A one-point rise in our federal government interest uh, rate, one point, just one point, is $150 billion a year in additional interest cost. We spend $150 billion on all military personnel in uniform. So line up all the Marines, the Army folks, the Air Force, uh, go down the list, $150 billion. One point. And so uh, it's interesting. We had a class yesterday, and we were talking about how spending basically a debt is spending pull forward. I remember I was at the University of Virginia, got an MBA there, and our finance professor, we'd sort of studied the perfect CapEx model, and then he puts the, the, the book down. And he says, forget everything I've said to date. The companies that have made it the longest actually had anything but a perfect CapEx model. They had low to no debt. And so the value to being able to deal with the problems, the way in which our economy is changing, the, the fourth industrial revolution that it's being called, is to say, let's make sure we have maneuver room as a federal government and are not strung out. And we are strung out right now. So think about, you know, the Fed has quadrupled its balance sheet. It has little room to move. Uh, you think about the deficits. We're at roughly a 5% deficit today. A, a run-of-the-mill recession is going to add another four points to that. You'll be at nine or ten points, which is today you have no capacity to move in terms of fiscal policy. We do not have options. So I agree with Jack on where we ought to go. The question is, will we, as a federal government, have the ability to change course and, 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 and be ready for that new economy and be ready to make the kinds of investments you're talking about and with a debt-laden uh, balance sheet, we won't, and that's where we are right now. And, and that tax cut last year did not help give us, did not help give us any maneuvering, that's for sure. You know, Jack, Jack mentioned uh, uh, concerns, antitrust concerns. As a, as a, uh, a libertarian, uh, are you concerned about the sort of massive consolidation that we've seen, and, and, uh, and what should the government's role be in that? No, we, again, Alicia was there. We got into an interesting conversation at the end of yesterday's class talking about, no, there's absolutely, I mean, I, I, again, I'm a conservative and I have certainly have strong libertarian bends, uh, but I, I, government, I mean, I believe that my rights extend until they begin to touch upon yours. At that point, they just ended. So government has a role as arbiter. That's why I vote against my own party on environmental matters. Um, that's why I vote against my own party on many civil liberty issues. Uh, and, and absolutely, given the growth of Facebook and Amazon and others, they're gargantuan, and our present laws don't fit. They need to be updated. We, uh, we, is there, oh, there's the microphone. There's a microphone there. Join the discussion here. Uh, and we'll start right, right there. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a current graduate student in political science. Thank you uh, for the debate. I just had a quick question. Um, throughout the discussion, we've kind of been focusing on uh, spending and, and the deficit and that sort of thing. And I kind of wanted to ask a, a more philosophical question about you know, the limits and size of government. Um, if we leave deficits and you know, gaps in the budget and, and spending aside, if we you know, pretend that all of those things are solved, <laughs> what on a personal 
level or a personal philosophical level, level do you think the boundaries of government power should be? If we're not talking about government spending, if we're not talking about balancing the budget, where do you think the government should stop just on a matter of principle? I mean, as a matter of principle, I, 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 I think that our founding fathers set up a system that was designed to enshrine maximizing individual liberty and personal freedom. And so there is no perfect line. I think that all developed societies across the ages have had a tug of war between security and freedom. Um, but it was Jefferson's observation that the normal course of things was for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. And so I fall on the side of pushing back on that battle line wherever one can so that you indeed maximize individual liberty. But I don't think that, there, that it's a three-point plan. I mean, I think it goes to every area of life. Um, I think the, the focus on freedom is important, but so is the focus on justice and fairness. And so those who argue for you know, the smallest possible government, um, would, I think government needs to be big enough to make sure that people are treated fairly in our criminal justice system. Um, and, you know, this does get real philosophical real quick, and I think, you know, sometimes the, it's, it's incredible to me the people who talk the most about freedom in small government are the ones, like in Alabama and other places in the South uh, right now, who are inserting governments in between a woman and a doctor. And, um, <laughs> And I, so I, I think that's sort of the, the problem with a lot of these conversations. They become, uh, you know, people try to make it so black and white, and it really isn't. And I want, I want a government that's big enough uh, to, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier uh, the, the financial crisis in 2008. If the government had done a better job of regulating the lenders, if they had done a better job of um, regulating the ratings agencies, which were giving AAA ratings to really lousy junk debt, we not, may not have got, gotten in the problem. And then afterwards, there were those who said the government should not have been involved in the, in the Recovery Act. I, I mean, I honestly hate to think, and, I mean, and, and the president came under intense pressure about that. That was a moment in time where the government had to be big and to step up and had to invest in whether the exact allocation of dollars was exactly as it should have been, I don't know. But that's a, that's a time where I think I want a government that's big enough to make the necessary changes. Thank and, you. and let me inter interject. So again, taking the flip side of, of where Jack is on that, I would argue it's big enough that you have enough in the way of resources to question the distribution of those resources. One in every five dollars that's spent in the United States of America is spent by government. And so with all due respect to my 434 former colleagues, if you were to wander around the, the chamber and see the way in which decisions get made, oftentimes here's the level of analysis. Whose bill is that? Oh, that's so-and-so's bill. Well, I'm not voting for that. Uh, and, 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 I mean, there is not exactly a... Sounds like someone had a bad experience or two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a heavy level of analysis that goes into the way that one in every five dollars you earn gets spent. I, I, and, I, I, and, and, and one other thing, just on that front, you could also take the flip side with regard to the financial crisis. Some would say, well, wait a minute. The banks, in many cases, were mandated to put out loans for folks that, frankly, didn't have the capacity to handle those loans, and so they created the ship. And then a lot of the inequity that we're talking about today is, in fact, created by a Fed that would go out and, and suppress rates, which helps the, the wealthy guy who has access to a hedge fund or private equity. But the savings vehicle for the average Joe out there historically has been a money market account or a CD. They're out of luck, and they've been completely stripped with regard to learning power, and it's exacerbated some of the wealth effect and some of the inequity that you rightfully point out. Hi, uh, my name is Russell Simons. I'm a third year medical student here at the university. Um, we've talked a lot, or we've heard conversation tonight a lot about debt on a macro level from a federal perspective, but I'm curious more about personal debt uh, and specifically student loans. 
So I'm, uh, I'd like to hear your perspectives, if you're willing, uh, on the role that government should or should not play in the distribution and management of those loans. And I'm standing here uh, knowing full well that I represent a class of people in the society, medical students, who carry an average student debt of $190,000 upon graduation. Uh, and that can exceed, for 25% of people, uh, $200,000. And I don't think I need to explain to everyone in this room how astronomical that amount of money seems to a young person like myself. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on student loans. I bet you wish you were at NYU at the moment. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, I, I'm actually a fan. There's a, there's a new kind of student lending that's developing. They're called income share agreements, which uh, exist in other countries, and they're starting to happen here as well, where essentially uh, what you repay from your student loan is based on what you earn after you graduate. And so instead of being left, you know, if, if you're, uh, you know, in, in a low-paying job, you don't have to pay the same back as if you're in a high paying job, even if you borrowed the same amount of money. And I'm, I'm hoping to see uh, more of that kind of thing. I mean, I, I have a lot of concern, by the way, of uh, I, I, I don't think the proposals out there to make all college free uh, to everybody is a particularly uh, good idea. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that ideas Just like ex the. Explain for a second why. Well, um, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, so first of all, uh, College is not for everybody. And I think there's some unbelievable opportunities for people. And we did a lot in Delaware that I was really proud of to make sure that high school students could graduate high school with a high school diploma, with some college credits under their belt, but also with a nationally recognized certificate or credential that proved that they could do a job, whether it's in advanced manufacturing, computer programming, culinary, sort of whatever it is. And so we had this huge, we, we really do have a big problem across the country where employers are using a college degree as a proxy when they're hiring people for a job that doesn't require a college degree. So there's a big movement afoot, I think really wisely, to say let's move hiring away from being based on a college degree to being based on skill. So that, that's number one. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important one. Uh, number two, if you throw more money at the problem, the universities have not had any, any problem as it is increasing tuition. And you, you throw more money at them, they're just going to increase tuition more. And, and, and the kinds of um, uh, you know, wars that they've had you know, to build the biggest and the best of this, you know, they, we, we built one last year, but now we need another one next year because the university down the road did the same thing. Uh, so I think that's a lot of pandering. I think it's, uh, the, the cost of doing it is crazy. And I, you know, I, as, as we're listening to these uh, candidates running for president speak, I'm attracted to the ones who are being a little bit more honest about uh, uh, what this could cost and what we really ought to do to, to assist students with their education. Well, nobody can accuse you of pandering here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Hadessa O'Neill, and I'm a first year undergrad at the college. Um, so my question is, what do you think the role of government should be in efforts to stop climate change? especially as it pertains to movements to switch non-renewable resources to renewable resources and how that will affect the job market in smaller agricultural communities. Yeah, let me just add 19 of the last 20 years, the warmest yeah. on record. We've all seen the acceleration of extreme weather events. Uh, so what, what should be done? Um, I, I don't know. It's a tough one as a Republican. It, it was de I mean, I proved deadly. I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I've come out and let said me, I, let I believe me ask, it's happening. Me. I believe it's real. If you live on the coast of South Carolina, for instance, the farm I grew up on, matter of inches, you can see the difference. Areas where, I, when I grew up, where pine trees growing are now salt flats. It's been remarkable to see how fast it's occurring. Um, Isn't that I, as I, threatening to these young people as, as the debt? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the world burning up is not a good picture. Right. Um, uh, but I, what I'd say is, is two things. One is um, I think that we've got to get more serious about nuclear. Uh, I think a lot of my friends in the environmental community are all in on renewables, but in terms of base load, we still haven't tapped it because we don't have the battery capacity to sustain the renewable and getting from there to wherever it needs to go. Um, and so I'm... I, I think the new renewable is part of it, and I, I think recognition of the fact that we have a problem is part of it, which we have a particular problem with on the right. Um, and I would say uh, we could do everything in the world in the United States, but if we don't have China with us and India with us, we've done nothing. And I think that's been one of the real problems in terms of political remedy, particularly with the Kyoto Protocols, is to say 
you know, how do, how do we get everybody else in the boat with us? Because if we leave out the big emitters and where the big growth in emissions taking place, we haven't solved the problem. No, I, I think it's a great question. And, and first of all, to Mark's credit, I actually um, reached out uh, this morning to a guy who used to be my secretary of natural resources. He's now the head of the National Wildlife Federation. And I told him we were do what we were doing, and I wanted to be able to, you know, make sure I had a good answer to that question. And he, he said you were absolutely one of the very best Republicans uh, on the environmental issues. So he, he, he said good luck, because he's really good. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think, I, I think there are uh, four things. So f first is fuel switching. So for example, in our state, we, uh, at least for probably for the first six years, we reduced uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions more than any other state in the country, and we did so by a bunch of coal fire uh, coal plants shifted to natural gas, and then the dirty one of the dirtiest coal fire power plants in the country actually became one of the cleanest because of some em emissions control equipment they installed. So fuel sh switching is important, and government can play a role in, in, in doing an incentive for that. The second is obviously to do more renewables and the same thing; those kinds of incentives. Uh, building efficiency. I mean, building efficiency. You, you get some very good return on investments. And so you think about a building like this, I don't know what kind of um, uh, you know, efficiency measures have, put in, have been put in place here, but you can see some pretty good improvements. And I think if we have revolving loan, front, loan funds and the like, that can make a big difference. And then finally, transportation. I mean, I just, you know, so, so much of the problem is by transportation. And I think I read recently that the, administ the current administration is, talk is talking about pulling back on the fuel, uh, fuel standards, which I think is a big mistake. I think the, you know, they've made some pretty good progress and can make additional progress, particularly with electric vehicles. So I, I do think there's actually a lot uh, that government uh, can do if we're, th if we're thoughtful about it. And, um, and some really good stuff is happening in states around the country. Thank you. How do we get the, f the, um, the government or using the tax code for social engineering, both on the corporate and on the personal level, so we get out some of the crazy loopholes that allow companies to not pay any taxes or to allow non-tax related issues to be dealt with in the tax code. So we just do taxation for taxation's sake and not for social engineering's sake. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I think government's got to be smaller. I mean, they're just built in inefficiencies into a democratic system. And, and you know, uh, pork and the grease that makes it run, at times there are trade-offs here and there. One man's gold is somebody else's something. And, and so what I'd say is I don't know that it's possible. Certainly could it be cleaned up? Yes. And that goes to a larger issue of the way campaigns are financed and the way that some people get disproportionate voice in the political system. But outside of that, I mean, I keep going back to what, again, Milton Friedman said. If you want to make government more efficient, make it smaller. I don't know what the political answer to that is. There was a great book written probably 25 years ago called um, Demo Sclerosis. And it sort of says it all. It's sort of about democracy, but sclerosis. And, and, and the reason that it's titled that way is they said, the author basically said, every time a new program or a new tax credit or something pops up, a whole constituency develops whose only job is to protect that program or that tax credit. And so I think, and I mean, I just can't, cannot imagine being under, you know, I've never served in the federal government. I can't imagine being in Congress or the Senate or the White House and being on the receiving end of all those lobbyists and when, when like things are going crazy at the last days of what is that final tax bill going to look like. It's got to be unbelievably dysfunctional. Well, we saw an example in the mid 80s of a bipartisan effort to uh, reform the tax code, and it did broaden the base, and it reduced the, uh, the uh, preferences, mm -hmm. and it was a battle. I mean, it was a war uh, there, but it happened because a president and the Congress uh, worked together on it, and I don't know if this environment lends itself to that. With all due respect, the, the bill you vote, yeah. voted with fell short of that. You know, and, and it was advertised as tax reform. It did lower corporate rates. Yeah, that's all it was. Right. Yeah. Every time they promise that you're going to be able to do your taxes on a postcard, it doesn't quite work. Right, like right. My name is Ronan Shatsky. I'm a third year economics major here in the college. And what struck me this evening, or after this evening, right, uh, is it really seems like despite the fact that this is a, technically a debate, both of you very much agree on kind of the basic precept that these questions are a matter of 
how we get there as opposed to what your motives are. It's just like so refreshing to listen to this like this this dialogue of ideas as opposed to accusations back and forth. You know, people don't care about America. I'm wondering. This is a broad question, but what is um, what what is standing in the way of this being more a part of the discourse? Is it is it the people who are running, or is it the structure of the governing bodies that we have? And depending on which one you think it is, I'm wondering if you have any ideas about what can be changed. Let me just say, I mean, and then all because these both these guys know a lot more about this than I do. Mm. The, what you saw tonight is pretty much the kind of discourse you get when you have governors talking to each other or even debating. Because the truth of the matter is we don't get measured based on, you know, if, we've, if we're a great speaker or the quality of our rhetoric. We get measured on really simple things like are our communities safer, are our schools getting better, are our jobs better and more plentiful, can, you, can the constituents uh, drink clean water and breathe clean air. That's what they care about. And so you don't find us, for the most part. I mean, when you, if you walk into a governor's only meeting at the me meeting of the national governors, you literally probably cannot tell the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. I don't know what happens in Congress. Uh, I mean, it's obviously totally the opposite of that, but I don't really have a good perspective of how to fix that. I, I think that there are a couple fixes. Um, I think that you know the, the proliferation of different media sources has exacerbated. So if I want to have a good day, I'm not going on Rachel Maddow's show. And if you want to have a good day, you're not going on Hannity. And, and that, that, I mean, that polarization, the way that people self-select the information that they're getting is, is, I think, problematic. And we've got to find some way not to go back to the big three and, you know, uh, 7 o'clock news, but, but something that brings us to a, 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 a wider debate than we're having right now. And I think that, you know, some of the congressional districts play to either extreme. Um, and I think some of the way in which campaigns are financed play to either extreme. Those three are three of the variable, three legs on the stool that I think have to be dealt with. It, did, it didn't give a lot of confidence yeah. when Mitch McConnell said shortly after the president was elected that his biggest priority was to make the president a one-term president. Yeah. But on your point about the, uh, about the nature of our districts, you, you're a living example of this. You had the temerity to challenge a president of your own party. It didn't work out so well. Voters, uh, your, prim <laughs> your primary voters said, you would be a great fellow at the Institute of Politics. Yeah. <laughs> we're going we're to give you that opportunity. So let me just say, uh, just as a, a closing stanza here, a closing thought, um, we do have, I think, some extraordinary challenges. We touched on some of them tonight. I think the issue of how technology and globalization is driving our economy creating enormous opportunity probably for everyone who's sitting in this room and creating uh, 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 real disruption for people who aren't well prepared to, yeah. to take advantage of it is one. Climate change uh, is another. Uh, debt. debt is another. Debt yes, debt, debt is another. Uh, it doesn't, I, I, just, I just want a closing thought from each of you uh, about whether, um, whether we uh, expect too much from government, that w what is the role of citizens to help solve these problems? And, you know, it, it, seems, it seems to me that um, we've created enormous expectations. And, uh, some, and one of the reasons we have such alienation is that I don't think, um, you know, I think those expectations exceed the capacity to, to act, at least in these grand ways. You know, the best answer I have to that, it's not my original thought, but about, um, I don't know, six years ago, I led a, a trade mission to, to Israel. And so we got to spend an hour with Shimon Peres, who at the time, he had just celebrated his 90th birthday. And this is a guy who had, uh, he was the president of Israel at the time. He had spent his entire life, you know, adult life in politics. He was sort of perceived to be the, the statesman of, uh, you know, the last several decades in Israel. And he said something to me that I'd never, I'll never forget. He said, I have, he's not, he just turned 90. He said, I've come to the conclusion that government is not the answer. The answer is these young entrepreneurs out there. The answer are the activists. The, the answer is these, the social entrepreneurs. Uh, that's really where the future is. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if that's uh, right. I think we need government better perform because you know, at the end of the day, and I, you know, sort of where I started, 
the strength of our system is really dependent upon whether or not the people have confidence in their government, that the government can deliver. And if they lose that confidence, we are, in a, we are going to be in a world of hurt. Um, I, I would say that, no, people don't expect too much from government, um, but they've been bitterly disappointed over the years. And as a consequence, you see the level of rage that you do right now from both the left and the right. And people are t tired of being disappointed. They're tired of being told one thing and seeing another thing happen. And, um, you know, we're at a, a real inflection point in terms of our civilization and where we go next. Um, and there are two roads ahead. Either people can sort of find ways to re-engage constructively and say, L let's jump back in this boat. I mean, you look on the back of a penny, it says e pluribus unum from the many one. That's what's carried us through our worst times, whether it's a World War II or some of the other, again, critical points in our country's history. Or we're going to go the other way. I think we have an incredible financial storm coming our way because we've not dealt with the debt thing and spending. And so historically, financial markets have been the ones that bring civilizations back to reality on that front. But it can be a wrenching process for the everyday person. And so I don't know which way we're going to go. But I don't think people have expected too much from government. They have been disappointed too many times. Yeah. Well, my hope is uh, that. Um we can have constructive conversations and we can jump in the same boat. The incentives are not aligned that way right now. Right. And survival being the first instinct of many people in public life, uh, there is not the, uh, the will to come together. And there is an impatience on the part of people who see these big problems and are, uh, and, 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 and are disgusted by a sense that everything is weaponized for political purposes rather than uh, a coming together around solutions. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons the Institute of Politics is here is because uh, these young people sitting here, and you know who you are, um, ha uh, have the capacity to change some of that, and it's desperately needed. We need, you know, and this, what, the point I was getting at is that we need to demand the kind of government that we want. And um, so it's not just demanding solutions, but attacking some of these problems that are standing in the way of finding them. And uh, that's going to require some reasoned discourse and a different set of incentives. And people need to be rewarded for doing that. Uh, so, And after and having spent two months on this campus, I, I feel good about that future, because I think these, these students are extraordinary and are going to do, do amazing things. I agree. I agree. Although that would come under the heading of pandering. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, thank you very much. First one.